Coming up today, it's all about melons and some winter squash, as well as bolting. You don't necessarily have to pull them out as soon as you see flowers. All that coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by for all your non-GMO organic and heirloom vegetable flowers and herb seeds visit dollarseed.com Sioux Growing Supply located in Wausau Wisconsin focusing on certified leaf compost an excellent amendment for poor soil retains moisture and adds nutrients which equals less water available in labor saver pre-filled trays and pots, bag and bulk. Visit SueCompost.com. Organic fertilizer for the health conscious organic home gardener. Family owned and operated. Visit WGardens.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind and soil hose filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew. Visit ManureTea.com. No measuring, no thinking. Stamp it, plant it, stop plotting, start planting. GardenStamp.com. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Baird. Well, it's time to plant our melons, our watermelons, as well as some of our squash here, winter squash. So it's an exciting time, as well as some cantaloupe here. We've designed a raised berm here that is about 80 square feet and we've constructed it with some of the re reusable found items that we have gathered over the years. We've got a couple of bottoms of baby cribs here. We've got a piece of a dog kennel there. We've got the side pieces of the baby crib. Now one thing that you might want to consider when deciding on what type of device that you want to trellis with is what is what are you growing because based on the gappage between your on your trellis these are awful big slats so what i have done is for, to assist the melons the cantaloupe the watermelon i've added some wire rubber coated meshing here so they can crawl up better and i've added some uh, stainless metal over here some fencing because we didn't have enough of the other as well as on the back side here i've got the other portion of the dog kennel in a triangular form to try to get and maximize as much space as we potentially can use here. The preparation for this bed has been we've added about four cubic feet of certified leaf compost and about 10 gallons or two five gallon buckets worth of used coffee grounds and that's basically in the center here as well as we've draped it around to where we are going to plant. Now not all melons are going to climb like a cucumber would based on the size of the stem and the type of fruit they're growing, they may grow vertical, but you may have to assist them by using some type of netting. And we'll get into that as we get to the point of these producing. So what do we have here? We've got a number of different uh, melons, and we've also, prior to planting here, we're going to apply some all-purpose vegetable fertilizer from Winchester Gardens. I pre-started these seeds about three weeks ago in these two inch pots and these are a great asset to a gardener. If you can get a hold of these, it'll really make your transplanting a whole lot more successful and easier because one seed in most cases goes in one pot and you don't have to worry about ripping roots apart. So with something like this, I've got uh, five, six, seven different varieties. You need a chart. So that's what I've got here. Now we've got some confection melons over here. I've got some spaghetti squash, some um, Pride of Wisconsin cantaloupe, as well as some Saskatchewan melons, some Vendelia winter melons. Now that's a uh, base, similar to like a honeydew, but they're designed that they will keep very well into winter. So that's something that we are excited about, as well as some crimson sweet watermelon and uh, some other watermelon that we will plant as well. So we're not going to be able to get all of this in one spot. That would be just 
crazy. So what we're going to do is try to pack as much in here, maybe being one variety of everything, and seeing how we can space to where everything will have at least some sort of climbing capabilities. Now, some of this may not climb at all, and that we're okay with that. It's fine exp allowing it to sprawl in the garden. So let's get started with the confection squash. And we're gonna start, I'm gonna do two of those there. Now, what a confection squash is, it's about a three to five pound melon. It, it's a, that's a hybrid variety, three to five pound melon that in this instance is gray that will keep, it's a winter squash, it will keep into the winter somewhat. Now let's see what else I have here. I wanna get my Pride of Wisconsin melons in, but first I wanna get the spaghetti, spaghetti squash in. And this may work relatively well, okay? Now what I'm doing here, I'm spacing these out because obviously, oh yeah, they're small, let's put them real close together. And even what I'm doing here is pushing the limits and the capabilities of what this bed is able to do with the amount of squash. So I may figure out what I've got and I may end up coming back and moving them or taking a few out. So that's what I'm going to do, figure out what I've got. And based on how your setup is, you want to plant as much as you can, but you don't want to crowd what you are planting. So I'm going to go ahead and get all this figured out and then I'll start planting. All right, so I've strategically placed them in the spacing that I feel is adequate for the particular squash or melon that we got. And obviously it's gonna be very crowded in here, but we're work working with a small amount of space. So we're gonna have to do everything we can to do you know, what we can with it. Now, what I suggest is if you are in a situation like this, don't put all of your spaghetti squash right here. And just like in other aspects of gardening, don't put all the same variety of tomatoes in one spot. Reason being is if, uh, let's say an insect comes or the vine, uh, squash vine moth comes and destroys these here, this, this spaghetti squash here, and I've got a spaghetti squash over on the backside and for whatever reason it doesn't touch that, it gives me the insurance that I have a chance that something's gonna produce somewhere. Whether you're on a grand large scheme or on a very small scheme, that's what you wanna do. You wanna maneuver things around so everything's not all eggs in one basket for a matter of speaking. So we've prepped the soil with Sioux Certified Leaf Compost, coffee grounds, we've added some 466 Winchester all-purpose fertilizer. Now planting squash is, uh, squash and melons fall in the same category. You're gonna plant them at the same depth as they are in the container. Don't bury them deeper, it's not gonna help you. It, can, it potentially could hurt and hinder the plant. So we just bury it, cover it up, and uh, that's pretty much it. Same thing over here. Helps that you have good loose soil that's highly high levels of nutrients. Put it right there. Now with these roots here, they're fibrous, they're not root bounce, and, and as I pull them out of the container, they're uh, going all over the place. So I'm not going to tease the roots, I'm just gonna place it right in the ground and since they're going all different directions, that will help the plant, it'll go ahead and realize it's in a new environment. So I'm gonna get the rest of these planted and then we'll get them watered in. All right, so I got them all planted, I'm just gonna give them a good dosing of water, even though they were really hydrated in the containers. And that's pretty much how you're gonna plant watermelon winter squash, eh, cantaloupe, between 85 and some squash will take about 110 to 120 days. Hopefully, if all goes well, and that's what we always say in the gardening community, if all goes well, we will have some type of melon and winter squash in this bed in about two and a half to four months. If you have nothing else to make compost with, grass clippings are a great use for this particular application. One thing you want to keep in mind is make sure you haven't sprayed your grass with some kind of toxic spray that's supposed to make it green or wonderful or lush. What you do, you can either cut it and let it go and then rake it up, or if you have a bagging system, that'll work great as well. We're going to make compost out of this, and it's going to be a little different of an application than the normal 50-50 ratio. Greens. This is a nitrogen base. Now, if you look carefully in here, there's a lot of brown type of material. This is not just a giant glump of green grass. There's some dead grass in there, some leaves, some other particles. So it's gonna, it's gonna have a small ratio. Now, we're gonna use this cage here, and we're gonna put 
this grass clippings in here, a couple of techniques you want to follow with this. If you have some limbs laying around, this is a good practice to do with this. Just put a few sticks and twigs every few feet or so. Now why am I doing this? Because grass, when it breaks down here, is just going to be this giant clump that's going to heat up very, very rapidly and it'll get 150, 170 degrees. That's fine, but it will get so hot that it will start to get lack of oxygen in the center because it's so compressed. So you get, you, it's got a, you got your big clump of green grass there and you don't have a whole lot of browns in there. So it's going to happen, it's going to heat up really quick and then kind of lose a lot of oxygen capabilities because it won't have enough, thing, enough browns to break down. So the reason why we're doing this is to add, and, and to add some spots where air can get in. Now you can just put the, all the grass in there and then come out every day or so and turn this to get that oxygen in there. But this way we can just leave it maybe every three or five days we can turn it and try to let the mycelium inside break down. That's the little white stringy stuff that looks like mold and do its thing. So we're just going to, uh, we've got some sticks in the bottom here and we're just going to take our grass clippings Throw some more sticks in there. And, and this has just sit, been sitting in the bag for about an hour now, and you can already, already feel the heat that's starting to build up in the grass. So, so composting can be done when you do not necessarily have a 50% brown to a 50% green. This will take a little different practice towards it. It may take a little bit longer because it's all nitrogen and all greens and very, very little browns. But this is a great way to maximize the use of your grass clippings instead of just letting them go back in the ground. Use them to compost, to put that compost back in your garden. Just because it's getting warm outside and some of your cool weather crops are beginning to bolt, go to seed, put flower heads on, that's not a necessary indication that you need to immediately extract them out of your garden. Now this all depends on how much space you have available that you're growing in. Now why wouldn't you just go ahead and pull the plants out when it's getting a seed pod on, much like this leaf lettuce here is. In our leaf lettuce bed we've already incorporated sweet corn in the bed so as this lettuce becomes bitter and starts to go to bolt, we already have another crop in there. It's kind of intercropping. But why wouldn't you just go ahead and rip this lettuce out, throw in the compost pile and be done with it? Well, because this will produce a very nice flower as well as thousands and thousands of lettuce seeds. Now, if you're into the seed saving practice, why is this beneficial to you? Because this plant has adapted to your environment, your garden, your growing conditions, the soil. These seeds are more apt to grow better in your particular garden than if you would go buy seeds somewhere else. They've been climatized because of the conditions they've been grown in. So that might be a reason that you want to not immediately extract them out of your garden. Same thing with the radishes here. They've got pretty little purple flowers on them. They're going to have seed pods on which are edible as, and as well as hundreds and hundreds of seeds. And this way you can, again, save the seeds and the seeds are climatized to your particular growing environment and they will actually do better than potentially some other seeds you may purchase. Now you don't have to save seeds but this may be a reason why you don't want to pull them up. Now if you're in no, con no concern or no practice of saving seeds and you just buy new seeds every year, by all means you can go ahead and rip these up, put in a compost pile, plant something else in the spot. Onions on the other hand, they will this is a second year onion. These are onions and leeks are biannual. We'll talk about leeks in a moment. This onion came up this year. We moved it over to our onion bed. What's going to happen is this is going to open up to a massive flower about the size of a tennis ball. It's going to turn white. There's going to be bees around it. And then as it dries, there are going to be thousands of little black seeds. That's your onion seeds. Now, this particular onion will not uh, store well, even if it puts a bulb on. You may get some that put bulb, put these flower heads on that first year. Again, you're going to have to use them right away. They're not going to store at all. You can save the seeds on the onions and leeks. They last about one year. You can get good germination out of. But that's the reason. That's what's happening with that one. It's because it's, a, it's going to seed 
And if there is a bulb on it, you can go ahead and eat that bulb, but it's not going to store well. Let's go take, uh, take a look at some leaks that we had from last year. We moved up to the high end for this very reason. Now these are leaks that we had brought over at the beginning of the growing season that had came back from our harsh winter. Same procedure, these are going to put on a big flower head. These are similar to a scape on a garlic and they're going to have thousands and thousands of seeds that we will can potentially replant or start next year. Now if you're in the food forest type of growing practice, you can just let these go to seed and then they'll seed themselves. Now they won't be perfectly spaced by no means, but you can rebuild and rebuild and rebuild your leek or onion bed that way. One more thing is bok choy is a very sensitive cool weather plant and that's what we're going to look at. Bok choy is an Asian green and you can see by the yellow flowers it's going to seed as well. It's a very cool weather plant and we're going to let that go to seed to capture some seeds. Cilantro will do the same thing and these are just some of the things that are going to seed in our garden. You can see what's going to seed in your garden and decide whether or not you want to save those seeds because they are more climatized to your growing conditions than anybody else's. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Baird and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.